All right, I'm gonna move down a little closer to you folks so I can see the whites of your eyes. So it's so good to be with you tonight. We're, we're looking at this theme, uh, we introduced our the Lord's Day for so some of you that's coming over from uh, the good side of town over there on the north. Uh, glad, glad to have you all here. That imagine the, the question, the, the majestic, awesome Lord of the universe wants to have fellowship with you. Are you interested? That's, that's kind of the thing we're looking at. And so obviously the, the crux of the subject matter we're looking at here is the ministry of the Holy Spirit because he's the one the Lord Jesus left behind after he departed to enable this. You know, when I was driving over here, I don't know if any of you all saw it, but it was one of the most glorious sunsets. You know, you're out Fort Sawyer looking at Fort Pop Place, right? I, I, in 25 years, I, we have come down Kellogg and looked in the west, and I've never seen it quite like the bright orange and everything. Now, I had no part in making that happen, right? And neither did you. That was totally his work, the work of Craig. But you know what? The awesome privilege is that he invites us to work with him in the new creation. You ever imagine yourself as, as in that? What do I mean? Well, everyone who's born again, according to the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and other places also, is a new creation in Christ, right? So the whole work of gospel living, the whole work of gospel sharing, and the whole work of discipleship after someone's saved is primarily the work of God and primarily the, the work of the third person of the Holy Spirit, although the Lord Jesus is also interceding in heaven as a great high priest, and that's got a big aspect of it too. But we're invited to participate with him. Now we can't do that apart from our total dependence on the Holy Spirit. We can't do that in the old nature. He's not going to use any of that, right? But he's given us his Holy Spirit. Now, I heard the question asked recently, and it's a good question. If you've got a notepad and a pencil handy, then I'd like you to get it out. And I'm going to ask the question, and you write down your answer, and then I'll give you the answer I think you should have answered. From the Bible, not from me. How would you define success? Most of us want to live in a world here that and be successful. Another word for that would be fulfilled, right? How would you define success? Because how you define success will determine your priorities, your perspective on life, how you spend your money, how you spend your time. Your whole energy and focus will be driven toward, whether you realize it or not, because it's subliminal even. It'll drive you even when you're not consciously thinking of it. Well, different people in the, in the world, I mean, I should have qualified this, but I kind of figured you understood, as a believer, success as a believer, not as you were before you would say. That, that would be totally. But some people define success at, at achieving a certain level of education. Some define it as a certain level of career advancement or accumulation of wealth, you know, getting a certain figure and accumulation of wealth. Uh, different ways people uh, define it. Some in the way of worldly accomplishments, titles, you know, getting a senator or president or some title given to your name. And when you make that the definition of success for yourself, uh, believe me, it, it'll color, it'll affect a lot of things in your life. But what should a believer define as success? A believer should define as success fulfilling the calling 
that you were created for by the glorious Lord of the universe. Right? And you're only able to do that by dependence on him and his Holy Spirit working in you. Now we're going to be here in, in John 14 in a minute, but but uh, if you want to look at it for yourself, you're probably familiar with these verses at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul gives us his definition. <coughs> for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. By the way, you may think because I'm 32 years old or 35 years old or 40 years old, the time of my departure at hand must be way out there. Don't presume that. It may be on your way home tonight. Right? Don't presume to, upon the grace of God. But statistically, we're all at different levels in that. But Paul had, the Lord had obviously communicated to Paul the time of his departure was at hand. Now Paul, when he wrote some 20 years almost before this, when he wrote 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he put himself with those who were going to be alive at the rapture, right? We who are alive will be caught up. And he does it again in 1 Corinthians 15, written a few years after 1 Thessalonians. But now he realizes that the rapture is not going to happen before his death. He's going to get the privilege, as he sees it, of being a martyr for his Savior. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race that is my race, his race. I have kept the faith all through there. That's the de definition of success, isn't it? In other words, he fulfilled the calling. God had a special calling for the Apostle Paul. It's unique. It's different from any of ours. And he can look back at his life here and say, I did it. And the reason he's not bragging, he's trying to encourage his son in the faith, Timothy, who's still left behind, still has a course to complete. And he's trying to, but he's also encouraging all of us because you realize if you're a child of God tonight through faith in the Lord Jesus, that you have a specific, unique calling from him. I'm talking about a calling to service. There's a calling to salvation. That's the gospel message. And we receive that. We're born again. And then we begin to realize it takes a different amount of time for each one of us. But we begin to realize, do I have a call to service? And you do. And you should be seeking what that is. Right? We want our young people to be understanding that. Because then you begin to avail yourself to the Lord. You make yourself available. And Paul did that. So, so finally there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, he'd just been talking about the unrighteous judge that's going to judge him, Nero and his court. But the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Okay? So Paul lays out for us, his definition of success. So we're looking here in the upper room discourse because that would be one of the places that has a large volume of material discussing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And really, as we pointed out on, on the Lord's Day, that shouldn't surprise us. We went through the Gospel of John and in chapter 5 and in chapter 6 and in chapter 7 and in chapter 10. John the Apostle is led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's helping to write this. He's building up an anticipation of this. The abundant life. You know, in John 10, 10. That's another 10, 10 right there, right? October 10th. And John 10, 10. Um, and so, we get here and, he, and the Lord announced in chapter 13 his departure. And, and there's a huge letdown. I mean, he says in chapter 16, I mean, you, I'm just giving you things. You all have been through the upper room discourse many times, I'm sure. But, but he says, but because, verse 6 of 16, but because I've said these things, your sorrow has filled your heart. Now the Lord Jesus is God. He can see into the heart. Sorrow has filled their hearts. I think that's beautiful. 
I think it's beautiful that sorrow filled your heart, and I think it's beautiful that the Lord acknowledged it. And the reason sorrow filled their heart is because they didn't understand what was happening. And when we don't understand what's happening, that could happen to us too. Hence, the Lord is giving us this information so we don't have to be in a misunderstanding or depressed condition when we think about success in the future and fulfilling our calling, right? And, and so twice at least, in this, in this portion, he says to, the, to them in verse 28 of chapter 14, he says, if you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. What? Did you catch that? If you love the Lord Jesus, <clears throat> you wouldn't have sorrow in your heart. You would be rejoicing because I'm going to the Father. Hmm. Why would they be rejoicing because the Lord Jesus is going to the Father? Because, because he's going to the Father, he can now send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who will be in them forever. <laughs> so you see, God has got a purpose. He's got a plan that he's working out. He says it again in uh, chapter 16 in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is, <clears throat> it is to your advantage that I go away. This had to be really <laughs> catching your ears. Because they're thinking, that's not what we think, Lord. We think it's to our advantage for you to be here. We like you being physically present here. He says, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. We pointed out in the Lord's Day, he initially started this idea of the sending of the Holy Spirit in chapter 14 and verse 16. And there he said, the Father will send the Holy Spirit. And then in 15, 26, and also here in 16, I will send. And that shouldn't surprise us because we're Trinitarian. We believe the Bible teaches that there's the God is Trinity. We're not Unitarian. We're Trinitarian. It's good for you to understand that. Back in my home area in New England, Unitarian Church just took over and the Holy Spirit left. And then still, the Unitarian Church has just took over that whole area where the, we had the Great Awakening and the Great Revivals of the days of Jonathan Edwards. It wasn't but a generation after those revivals that this Unitarian thought came in. And of course, Unitarian <coughs> says that Jesus is not, he can't be deity. And if he's not deity, you're still in your sins, <laughs> according to John chapter 8, right? So it's an important truth to God. It should be an important truth to all of us. All right. So I'm going to come back here to John chapter 14. And we've already looked at verses 15 to 18. He tells them in verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I will not abandon you. And I will come to you in this way by means of the helper. That's in verse 16. I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper, another like me, that he may abide with you. How long? Forever. You can say it out loud because we're interactive here on our weeknight studies. So we... Right, brother, we can do that. And, and then he says, he calls him the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. By the way, how would they know about him? Did they need the New Testament to know about the Holy Spirit? No, he's all over the Old Testament, right? But particularly, as we pointed out, uh, Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31, the two clearest prophecies it's add Joel chapter 2 to that too. The clearest prophecies of the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit is part of the characteristic of the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 10. Right? <clears throat> so he says, I will send him. And he'll be, he will, he, because he now dwells with you, with the apostles. But he will be, you see the, the change in the tense of the verb? He now dwells with you, present tense, but he will be in you. 
And so we're going to go through, I'll give you a list here in a minute of, I, I see 16 primary uh, energies of the Holy Spirit in a believer that, that we should be aware of and participating in. The first one is indwelling. Okay? And I had a brother ask me years ago, well, what do you mean indwelling? We don't use it. What a good, we were writing a doctrinal statement. And I thought indwelling needed to be in there. He said, we don't, nobody knows what that is. Well, they should know what it is. It's in the Bible. Read Romans chapter 8 <laughs> and a lot of other places. Indwelling, the Holy Spirit indwelling, coming, and this, this would be also one of the verses right here in 14, 17 of John. And as he indwells, he'll, the Lord Jesus goes on to say some, some of the most majestic truth with regard to this indwelling that's in the New Testament. Let me give you two of them. Right here in chapter 14, in 14.21. And, and read this along, because you've got to see it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. He who has my commandments, that is, he who has the word of God, and keeps them. And that word keep has the idea of not just doing them and obeying them, but it has the idea of guarding them, treasuring the word of God, guarding it, realizing the specialness of it. He who keeps them... <clears throat> It is he who loves me. So he defines for us. You don't have to worry about faith because he says, you'll know someone who said, if they say, if they talk, they love me and, and they'll, you know, in the Lord's Supper, oh, we love you, Lord, but then they don't treasure the word of God. There's an inconsistency there. Right? Because he's already said, if you love me, you treasure my word. That'd be one of the characteristics of you. You don't argue against it. You don't try to prove the wrongness of the word of God. God forbid. There are a lot of young people that are being uh, challenged to that by the internet. And we're sorry. That's the generation you're growing up in. I didn't grow up in that technology. And I'm glad I missed that. I'm glad that train left the station before I came along. But anyway, for you young people. And so we've got to, we want to be helpful. We want to encourage you. You're living in a technology age that has never existed on planet Earth. Clearly. Never existed. And um, it has particular challenges with regard to the Word of God. So he says, continuing in verse 21, and this is the special part. <laughs> the, the first part of the verse was kind of introductory, sets up the second half of the statement. Look what he says. And he who loves me, uh, that, by the way, that I could go on a sidetrack on this, but I mustn't do that. But there's a whole technique here that the Lord Jesus uses in the upper room discourse. Have you picked up on it? That he'll give a statement. John uses this technique in 1 John 2 in his, in his letters. That he gives a statement and then he comes back and just and, and adds to it, it, kind of says it again, but adds to it and embellishes it. It's a little different technique than Paul uses in, in his letters because of the audience and other things. And I think it's beautiful. So he says, so he's already said, he who loves me, and then he adds, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. You want to be loved by the Father? I sure do. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Well, how will he manifest himself to us as believers. Well, that's what we'll see as we work through these passages on the Holy Spirit um, tomorrow night in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, for instance. But right here in the Upper Room Discourse, we'll see here in a few minutes how the Holy Spirit will magnify Christ in the Word to us. He will teach us concerning Christ from the Word and all these kind of things. That's why we pray before we come to the Word of God. And you need to make that a habit in your time alone at home too. Not just in the public meetings. In your time in the Word of God, when you, before you come to the Word, ask the Lord. It doesn't have to be a long embellished theological prayer. But ask the Lord to open your eyes. Open your open my eyes and I might see wondrous things out of thy law. Psalm 119, verse 18, right? And a lots of other scriptures you can quote. I'm just quoting that. That to me, I will manifest myself to him. 
Now that is real. And that is experiential. If he manifests, if you see something clearly about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in his word in your time of reading, and you don't feel anything, mm -hmm. then what are you, just a cold slab of steel? Is that, I mean, are you just a, a rock? A dead rock? No, you're alive. You have, you have emotions. You get excited about the football games. I do too. I mean, I did watch Kyle Larson win yesterday, and I cheered that on. But anyway, uh, because I had an opportunity. I wouldn't have, if there was ministry involved, I would have set aside watching that NASCAR race. But, but whatever it is, you get it. You know, you go to a football game, you go to a NASCAR race, and you, and, and you cheer, and they say, well, the, you're just a fan. You're just a fan. But you, you get excited about the Lord on the Lord's Day, and now you're a fanatic. Well, how come you're you go? How come you're not a fanatic at the Chief Stadium? You know, and you're a fan of the Lord. Why don't we reverse that one? Make society reverse that one. Fanatics go to the football games and NASCAR races, but fans are those who love to sing about the Lord. They love to put all their energy in singing. You know, using up all that oxygen in your lungs and pushing it out your, from your diaphragm. You know, they, they got me an opportunity, the Lord opened an opportunity for song leading. I never led singing in my life. But we have a, a hymn sing on Tuesday nights at the condo down there. And uh, the man that's been doing it, he's been doing it. He goes back to the old Bible Town Conference Center days, and he's 93. And he just can't push the air out, and, and he can't remember songs, and he stumbled around. So they, they heard me singing. And they, wow, Brother Wheeler, he could sing, get him up there. And so they had, I said, no, no, that, that's not my. And, and Brother Hescock came to me and said, Thomas, would you do it for the Lord? Well, when you ask that way, <laughs> you can't say no to that. And he's a very godly man, so I know he's sincere. And, and so I've been doing that. And thankfully, you know, I would talk to one of the men. He said, where did you, you know, where did you learn all these songs? And I remember back... In the days in Houston, on Saturdays, you know, and I got saved listening to the KCB radio in Houston, the commercial three Christian stations. Still goes on, and I support that work. But they have a they have a by request time, four hours of Christian music uninterrupted on Saturdays from one to four thirty or something like that. Twelve thirty to four thirty, something like that. And back in the days when I was first saved in, in, in the eighties. I would just, I would go get a smoothie because I, I was into running and working out. And, and I'd park out in, in an area outside of the neighborhood, just on the side of the street, and sit there and listen, and just listen to the music. People would have probably thought I was crazy. But I just want to get out of any interruption and sit there and just listen and, and, and kind of learn the hymns. I, I was learning the hymns because I did not know the hymns coming from my background. And I told this man that a couple of Tuesday nights ago, I said, now I real back then I wondered, why am I doing this? You know, I, mean, I was not playing golf. I don't play golf, but I was, other things I could have been doing at that time. And I just felt led of the Lord to do it. And then here I am, the Lord knew I was going to be leading singing in 2022 and 23 and 24. I didn't know that. So he was, you realize he was preparing me for it because I was learning the hymns. And the hymns that we're singing in the little chorus book they got were the ones I was learning. You see how our God works? He's preparing. He was preparing you way back 30 years ago for something that's coming up now. And, and we can't connect the dots. That's why we can see more clearly looking back than we can looking ahead, right? The, the guidance of the Lord. <clears throat> and so along with, if you wrote down in dwelling, is the first one of these. The word, the name of the Holy Spirit, paraclete. Here it's translated helper, um, which is one way to translate it. Counselor is in some of the uh, versions. Literally, the one called alongside. And that would have the idea of helping, comfort, counsel, affirming, encouraging, refreshing spiritually. 
edifying spiritually. All of those words could be put in there. You could put edifier with a capital E. You could put encourager with a capital E. Okay? That goes with that one idea of indwelling. That in a theological textbook, indwelling would be a whole section. Um, but we don't use it that much, but it's a scriptural word, right? If, it's, if it fits better with your mind, <coughs> use the term he uses here, and will be in you in 1417, okay? Will be in you. And, and along with that, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that's really special. That, now, 1 Corinthians 14.3 14, is defining what the spiritual gift of prophecy, which I believe applies more to, now to preaching, not to foretelling, but foretelling. It, it can be used both those ways in the Old and New Testament. And, uh, and it's one of the seven final gifts listed in Romans chapter 12. You know, the main seven gifts right there in Romans 12. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Okay, so those are the three things we're talking about. The Holy Spirit's ministry and dwelling. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. You know, it's interesting, another thing, and I marked it down in my journal way back when I first started going to the assembly at Rayburn, and we were doing an evangelism class, it just turns out that fall. And 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 one morning I woke up and and this verse was on my heart. And I kept and it was just strongly on my heart. Later on, the Lord called me to a preaching ministry and a teaching ministry. And I believe he was already telling me that way back in 1985. See, it didn't didn't really become together until 97, 98. And there was some preparations needed. But that's how he does it. And to me, that's fascinating to try. That's why we journal. To try to mark those special things out. You know, when the Lord communicates that to us, and then he might go silent like me for 12 years. And then in 97, when I'm doing it, I said, oh yeah, 1 Corinthians 14, 3. Now I'm doing what he told me. What he created me to do. See, at that time, I was a professional engineer. I loved engineering. I would not have left it except for him. Because I loved what I was doing. I was moving toward the three, six-figure salary by the time when I left in 95. And but when he puts on your heart, when he, if he has a particular special, and it's not, each one of us is unique, right? So we're not saying that there's no cookie cutter here. But it, you know, it applies to everybody this way. But when you are, have been called to a particular work of service for the Lord, you will never be happy and satisfied and fulfilled not doing that. You with me? Think about it as if you, not all of us are gifted at creating tools. I admire men and women that, that can work on a lathe and work in a machine shop and create a you know, specialized tool, whether it be a wood or steel or bronze or whatever. And, you know, just to think that they had to imagine in their, in their imagination first before they drew it out and, and made it. Now, when he imagined it, he made that tool for a particular purpose, right? I mean, he went, he's not just trying to waste metal because it's expensive. So he, he had a particular purpose in mind that this tool, and he didn't have anything else that could do it, or he wouldn't, he wouldn't have made the new tool, right? He would have used one of the tools he had, but he made this specialized tool for this purpose. And that tool, that, that tool was to help him work on a particular machine, and the tool said, nope, I'm going to work, I want to work on changing a tire on a car. I want to be the one that takes the lug nuts off the tire on the car. Well, I didn't make you for that. You won't fit. You'll strip all the nuts if you try to turn them because it's not the right size or whatever it is, right? And the Lord of the universe made you and me in Christ for a particular purpose. And you will never be happy unless you do what he wants you to do. Now, as a point of comfort and a point of pastoral uh, ways we can help each other, Pastoral just means shepherding, okay? Helping, shepherding. We may know people that got on a wrong road for a long ways. 
as Christians away from what they were made to do, right? And there's hope in the gospel. And there may be some in this room like that, right? I don't know. I don't know the details of all of you, but um, it's not too late to get back. Come to the Lord. Get on your face. I mean, put your nose in the dirt. I've done it many times. It's very refreshing. <laughs> get on your face and just confess. Say, Lord, I busted it up. <laughs> I messed up. I want to get back on track for you. Show me how. He loves to answer that prayer. He's in the restoration business. He loves to restore. We'll see that later on. That ought to be Thursday night. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. All right, so indwelling is the first one. And then we move further down in chapter 14 still, in verse 26. He comes back after he's dealing with the Judas, not Iscariot question, and, and that's just an elaboration of the indwelling, right? Judas is not Iscariot says to him, there were more, there were two Judases than the apostles, were there were two Jameses too. And, and so he says, well, how is it, because he doesn't understand this ministry of the Holy Spirit yet, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Because you walk into a room physically, Lord Jesus, everybody sees you, not just us see you, everybody sees you. Well, when the Holy Spirit walks in the room, you know, only the believers sense when the Holy Spirit is present. <coughs> and that comes from spending time in the Word of God, right? We begin to sense when the Holy Spirit is present, and when He's not present, and when He's not present, we should be looking for that little red sign that says EXIT <laughs> and get out of there, right? And so 1426, but the helper, same word he used earlier, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. I love that. You see the, you see the Trinity in that one clause? It's not, not, not in the whole verse, it's a clause of a verse. All three persons of the Godhead. We didn't make that up. This is how God reveals himself. He will do what? Another ministry. He will teach you how many things? Better circle that word all, because you might forget it. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance how many things? That word all ought to be in there again. Circle it again. That I said to you. See, this gets into the whole... Now, that he's given this to the eleven, right? So they had a particular assignment and mission from the Lord of the universe to write the New Testament. And all the books of the New Testament were written by the apostles except for Mark and Luke. But both those, those records, Mark, we believe, the early church believed this, and there, you can prove it from internal evidence within Mark, that when you compare Mark and the records of our Lord's uh, ministry, in the ministry of the Word, and Peter's sermons in the first 12 chapters of Acts, you see parallel. And, and we believe, and I believe strongly, that Peter, this is really Peter's, Mark is Peter's gospel. Okay? So Peter is the eyewitness that was there that informed Mark, and we know that Mark traveled with Peter in Peter's later years, right? Peter says that in 1 Peter 5. And, it, and to me, it's fascinating. When, you, when we, I'm not saying ex, eisegesis here. We're not reading in. We don't want to do eisegesis. We got to do exegesis. We got to go get it out from the text. But you can see Peter in some, some of the things like the things that Mark leaves out, that Matthew leaves in, were things that you could see where Peter would say, "Don't include my name in that," because it might magnify Peter. Anything, anything that would humble Peter, Peter wants in there. But the things that might magnify Peter are not in Mark. And then that one phrase when they come back. And then the crowds are gathering, and he says, we're so busy, we didn't even have time to eat. Now, that sounds like Peter. That, I'd be with them on that one, too, you know? The crowd was so busy, they were so busy. The Lord didn't, wasn't worried about going to get a Subway sandwich, but Peter was. And I like that. You know, it's just the humanity of it. And then Luke, well, Luke tells us that he consulted eyewitnesses. You know, he consulted Mary. Where do you think he got the, 
the account of the birth, virgin birth. So he, he went to the sources, primary sources. But there, the heaviest influence for Luke, but who did he travel with? Paul. And that's why when you see 1 Corinthians 11 and Paul says, I, when you're talking about the Lord's Supper, I gave you what I got directly. I didn't get it from the other 12. I got it directly. And you compare that to Luke 22, and Luke's account of the Lord's Supper is word for word almost the same as 1 Corinthians 11. Well, that's what you would expect, because Luke traveled with Paul, and, and so Paul told him what he got from the Lord. Luke said, well, that, that's the source I want. So he put it in. So this is part of studying the Word of God and seeing it in his perspective. But how were these men able, all the things... Remember, John tells us the books couldn't contain it. All, our Lord was busy all the way every day. He's, there's one section, we call it the busy day, where the synoptics give us details of what happened all in one day, and I'm going, shoo-wee, and then, they, and then they get, after a full day, they get on the boat and go over to the Gadarian demoniac, you know, across the sea. All that is all in one day, if you study it in the record. How did they remember this? Well, just so you don't really need to know this part, but out there in the commentaries, you'll read that some believe that one of the apostles took cliff notes, you know, had a notepad handy, and, 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 and they call that document Q. Now, we don't have any record of that, except what we have in the synoptics. If any of the apostles did that, I would think it would be Matthew. I mean, he was the accountant. He was a tax collector. So he's a detailed guy. And a detail, guys, who would you would want taking those kind of notes? And that's why we see the record of what we call the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, parallel so closely in these stories. Because they were relying on whoever it was. Matthew's not the first one that's written. It's pretty well documented now that Mark was the first gospel written in terms of time frame. So if you say, well, we all know Mark got it from Matthew, well, Matthew wasn't written yet when Mark wrote. So you can't say that. So you could make a case. Okay, I'll go along with it. That still, that doesn't take away the inspiration of Scripture because the Lord is using whoever's taking the notes there to take those notes and use them. Makes sense. God does that. Um, in other times in the Old Testament. But don't leave out what he says here. <clears throat> along with everything I just told you, there's the supernatural side of this that the Lord says the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance, not some, all the things. So there's, you, with the Holy Spirit's help, they didn't need document Q. Okay? But that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit might not use document Q as well as direct, supernatural, remembering things that they would never remember themselves. I mean, the, the trauma of what they went through with Passion Week alone wiped out a lot of, it would, it would wipe out our memory, right? Because they weren't expecting the crucifixion, you know, then the resurrection three days later, and then the ascension, you know, I mean, all this is hitting them. And it's traumatic, it's emotional, and it, the Lord says, don't worry, I'll help you. The Holy Spirit, when the Father will send in my name, will enable you in a special way to record the scriptures accurately, word for word, accurately. We, the technical term is verbal, plenary inspiration, right? 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1.21, those are the two key verses of the inspiration of the scripture. There are others too, but those are the two big ones. It's abundantly clear. But you could add this too. Our Lord says that he was able to. But also, because that, that was dealing with the apostles, right? And they're all dead. But their records got preserved. And I believe the Holy Spirit is involved in that too, even though that's not one of the 16, because that doesn't impact us directly. But I believe he was involved in putting the canon of, this, of the Bible together, both the Old Testament and the New. And yet he used people elders, and they called themselves bishops too back then, 
but that's just another word for elder. They're interchangeable in the Bible. And in the Council of Nicaea, 324, 325 AD, Constantine, the Emperor Constantine was residing there at that and so forth. But for us, in 1426, he will teach you all things. So he's the primary teacher for the capital T. And when we come to the Word of God, we ask him to teach us. But the fact that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling within us is sure going to make that teaching process continuous, right? Holy Spirit, teaching, convincing of the truth of the Word of God. Well, then the next reference is in chapter 15, at the end of the chapter, verse 26. And here he adds, this would, be, this would not be a separate thing in my 16, this would be a subcategory of the teaching that we just covered, okay? In 1526, but when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, that's what he called him in verse 17 of chapter 14, the continuity, who proceeds from the Father, now he adds, he will, what? Testify of me. So I would add that as a subcategory, or put parallel connected to teaching. He'll teach you all things, and he will testify of me, is affirm the Lord Jesus in the Word of God, which is part of the teaching process, isn't it? As, he, as we read the Word of God and He teaches us, one of the things we're going to be expecting Him to do, now He's going to add another word to that in chapter 16, He will magnify me. So as you're reading the Word of God, and that to me would be another, another set, subcategory of teaching, he will, he will magnify me in the, in the process. But we'll come to that here in a minute. In chapter 16. So he'll testify of me. And then in chapter 16, in verses 5 to 15, there's a long section here in chapter 16 dealing with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it has to do with both toward unbelievers and toward believers. So verse 5, John 16. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him. When in, on Sunday, for those of you that were there, when did he send him? The 50th day. Ten days after the 40th day, 40 day post-resurrection ministry, ten days later, the 50th day, which happens to be Pentecost, which happens to be one of the Levitical 23 annual feasts, which when God gave the annual feast, it was looking forward prophetically to this event. Just like Tabernacles is looking forward to the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation period. And that's, that's another whole beautiful thing, too. And, of course, Passover, the cross, and the, the uh, deliverance because of faith in the Lord Jesus. So he says in verse 8, And when he, remember, I'm going to say it again, I, and then I'm going to say it after, that, after tonight, this week, but I said it yesterday. Don't call the Holy Spirit an it. Please. I've known, I've heard some dear brothers, and I, I, I say, Lord, they, he didn't realize what he said, because I say that silently, because they, they should know better, they'll say, well, it, you know, or the, the power it. it, he's a person, so it's him, it's he, and that's how the Bible presents him, I'm not presenting him, that's how the Bible presents him, and so we want to honor him, right, he's part of the Godhead. Isn't that something? Part of the Godhead dwelling inside of you? Do you want that? Do you, do you relish that? Do you realize how awesome a privilege that is? The Old Testament saints didn't have that. Don't you realize that you thought about when you, when you and I are in heaven and David or Moses comes up to us and asks us, wow, 
about what was it like you had the dwelling Holy Spirit and you were under the new covenant we were under the old covenant we had all kinds of limitations and you had the Holy Spirit indwelling you what was it like serving the Lord well we won't want to say well I kind of moped around and went to work and did my thing never smiled even when they mentioned Jesus didn't want to sing because I was afraid of what people thought of my voice and they're going <laughs> We did more than that under the Old Covenant. Right? Beloved, we should be different. If the Holy Spirit's living inside of you, you're not what you were, and I hope you never want to go back to what you were. You're a new creation. The Lord says, act like it. Live like it. Rejoice like it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Live in me, he says. And so he says in verse 8, and when he has come, he will convict the world, now it's not about unbelievers, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But we didn't know this before this statement. This is one of the clearest statements of what, and this one I do have in my list, the drawing ministry of the Holy Spirit, okay? You say, where do you get that? Well, right back here, I told you on Sunday, but John 6, 44, if you want to see it with your own eyes, it's also in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, but here in John, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. And then in chapter 12, in verse 32, with regard to the Lord Jesus, now is the judgment of this world, now the rule of this world will be cast out, and I... If I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Remember I said to you, the Father's involved in drawing, the Son's involved in drawing you and me, individually, you. When you were saved, you say, well, how long did he do that drawing ministry? Well, we don't know. But probably a lot longer than you think. I mean, we think sometimes, well, I would say... You know, for me, I'll just use me as an example so nobody thinks I'm picking on them. Right? That's why I use me as an example. Because you know, people say, well, he was talking about me. I don't like it. So I, so I don't want to do it to anybody. I'm not talking about me. But I got saved at 26. You know what I think the Holy Spirit, now this comes through time and the Word of God and meditation. Right? By the way, meditation on the Word of God is so important. That, that is part of what, this, what we're talking about in this series. Psalm 1, blessed is the one who just reads the Bible and then closes it and says, I have my 15-minute family altar and then puts it on the shelf and lets it collect dust for a while. Is that what Psalm 1 said? Blessed is the man who meditates on the Word of God day and night, which is a Hebrew idiom, a Hebrew euphemism for all the time. That's a characteristic <clears throat> of a born-again Christian who's walking in the Spirit. And all of us says, oh. Up in the deer blind, brother can do that, right? I mean, especially if you can memorize scriptures, but if you have a little pocket thing, or washing a car, or, I'm not picking on Jim, but wherever you are, you know, I'm at a NASCAR race, whatever it is, you can be, our minds are really flexible and creative, you know, and, and they can come up with this. But this is what... It, in Joshua 1 8, same thing. Success, you prosper if you meditate on the Word of God. So that is, you read it and then you keep going over in your mind. So, in, because of time in the Lord, in the, in the Word of God, and the Lord has shown me, you know when He began to draw me when I was three years old? I didn't get saved on 26. That tells you at least two things how stubborn my heart was and how patient the Lord is. When I was three years old, my aunt, God bless her, she turns 90 today. No, tomorrow, the 5th. I got to call her tomorrow. She's, a, she's been a nun since she was 18 years old, my mom's younger sister. But she does know the Lord, but we have discussions about a lot of other things. But, but she, I think she's going to be in heaven. But she told me when I was, she said, God put his hand up. Now, I don't know why she did that. And you're going to be a priest. And I'd never married, and, and so my mom, 
That isn't why, but it just worked out that way. I mean, I proposed it three, three different times, but it didn't work out. So, so um, and I know you're all saying, well, we understand why you really didn't say it, but, but uh, my mom, you, now later, you know, she came to know the Lord and she stopped saying what she, you know, after I was saved, you know, for a long time, she'd say, you know, well, the Lord wanted you to be a priest. That's why you've got you still single. Aren't you getting it? Aren't you connecting the dots here? You know. After she got saved, she she realized. But my aunt still says it. She did when I talked to her back in January. She said, "I still wish you were a priest, but I'm happy with what you're doing for the Lord." You know. She's serving the Lord in a different way. Her mission was was a mission of mercy to uh, the poor and the aged. She washes feet of people that you and I probably wouldn't want to get near. So I, I, I'm not going to throw stones at that. But anyway, the Lord shows us in you know different things, and you can begin to put in you know five years before I was saved, a close friend of mine, and we're going to start racing the same year in '79, and in '77 he gets killed in a head-on collision. He's in a pickup truck. He gets crushed. Two other of his buddies are in the truck, and they hardly have a scratch on them. Steering wheel came into him, leg bent under the seat. It was a terrible thing. And it was, Jim's not here. We were talking about Ford. That Ford I beam suspension, the, the suspension broke on a Ford pickup coming his way, and it, right at the last minute, steered into him. It, it, no way you could miss it. And he had started showing me the Word of God. He, he, one time, we were sitting out in his truck talking, and he said, open up that glove box, and there was a Bible, and I said, Dwayne, you Bible? Yeah. And he started to tell me about a Bible study he was going to, and how he was trying, well, after he was killed, his mom couldn't believe I wasn't a believer. She said, of course, Dwayne was a believer, you know, and why aren't you? But there were lots of other circumstances, and you don't want to hear about it. But I love to think about, you know, because it was all the Lord working, and He's done. You can make a record of those things in your life too. And why do you want to do that? Because it gives glory to your Father, remind you how much He loves you, remind you how patient He is, how He didn't give up on you. He should have given up on me even long before He did. That's one of the things I told Him. In that prayer, November 10th, 1982, you should have given up on me, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> and if you'll take me now, I want, I want to be saved, <laughs> along with some other things I told him. So the Holy Spirit, well, now this, this is a little more detail. He says, he will convict. So I'm adding to the, you could put it as a subcategory of drawing, but I'm adding now the third one, in dwelling, Teaching, drawing, and now the fourth one, convicting. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts unbelievers that they're sinners. You and I can talk to them till we're red in the face or blue in the face or however you want to think of it, and that isn't going to work if the Holy Spirit's not involved. And that's why you've got to be involved in prayer. We pray before we go to that person by name if we can. We pray silently while we're giving the gospel to them. And then after we leave them, we keep praying, hopefully by name, if we get their name. And that's not as essential, but God likes that personal aspect of it. That's participating in the new creation, isn't it? When a human being that's on the broad road to destruction and in total darkness, and not only are they in darkness, but darkness is in them, according to Ephesians 4, 17. Now suddenly, they're in the light. They were dead, now they're alive. And God can use you and me as an instrument in that. And now they're going to be in eternity in the good place, where they were headed to the bad place. Is there anything on earth that we could do that could be more important than that? There's only two things on this planet that are going to survive. The Word of God and human souls. The rest of it's all under judgment. So what the world says is success, 
And all the, oh, you, okay, you get a park named after you. Well, it's all going to get burned up. You get a street named after you. It's all going to get burned up, you know. But if there's just one person in heaven that's there because the Holy Spirit was working through you and or me in bringing them through this conviction process. And we'll talk about it tomorrow night because I'll pick up because you pick up where we are here. But where, what is the Holy Spirit? He's going to use the conscience. He applies this truth of sin, righteousness, and judgment to the conscience. And everyone has a conscience. And everyone's responsible for what they do with their conscience. Right from the, uh, when they're this old with Bella's age, at that, that age, even the, they're already do, they're already affecting their conscience by how they respond to good input and bad input. That's what Romans 2.15 tells us. Their, their conscience either accusing them or excusing them according to the truth of God. Well, this is awesome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is the kind of truth that I want to have my focus on. Mm -hmm. And the Lord put on my heart to share it with others. So we'll close right there tonight. And Lord willing, with your help, Lord, pick up tomorrow. We thank you, O oh Father, for recording these truths and preserving them and guiding those who put everything together. Oh, it's, it's, it goes beyond anything we can ask or imagine, Lord. But then teaching us by your Holy Spirit what this, how this truth relates to our lives and how we can participate and be available and surrender to you, Lord, so we can be fruitful and thereby fulfill each one of our missions for you. That's what we want. We want fulfillment. Why? Because it gives you glory. And if we love you, we want you to receive all the glory. And what a privilege we have to be those that give you glory. Not like Lucifer who took, took, takes away from your glory. We want to be those who give you glory. So we thank you, O oh Lord. Take us all home safely. Thank you for all that's here. We pray your blessing now in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.